Our next speaker uh, is uh, the man behind the curtain who's now going to come in front of the curtain, Ken Schwartz. He is a board member at Vertical Flight Society and president of Aeromedia Communications. Ken was recently elected to the board of directors of the Vertical Flight Society, which is formerly the American Helicopter Society. He's been the driving force behind the society's EV toll news initiative since early 2017 and is a contributing editor of VertiFlight magazine. He has over 25 years of experience as a senior aerospace marketing and communications strategist with major commercial aircraft manufacturers, special mission helicopter operators, regional airlines, and flight and training simulation companies. At Aeromedia Communications, Ken works with OEMs and commercial aviation companies, developing market forecasts, aircraft economic models, sales and marketing campaigns, and digital media content. Ken previously worked as a senior market analyst at Bombardier, developing billion dollar marketing campaigns for the highly su successful CRJ, regional jet, and Q-series Dash 8 airliners, and previously managed large fleets of Soviet and Western helicopters supporting UN peacekeeping forces. In 2010, Ken won the Helicopter Association International's Communicator of the Year Award. He's published more than 1,000 articles on vertical flight operators and commercial aviation in VertiFlight, Vertical, Skies, Helicopter International, HeliData News and Helicopters, and co-authored the corporate histories of Pratt & Whitney Canada, CAE, Bell Helicopter, Textron Canada, and Airbus Helicopters Canada. He is going to talk to us about the electric VTOL revolution. Ken. <coughs> I'm presenting on behalf of the Vertical Flight Society, uh, which was up until uh, a couple months ago known as the AHS International and previously the American Helicopter Society. Uh, it is an organization that was founded 75 years ago by the pioneers in the rotorcraft industry in 1943, July 1943. People working at Sikorsky and other companies at the very start of helicopter manufacturing recognized there was a need for industry-wide collaboration. Now the industry at that point was probably 100 people and uh, it was concentrated largely in the Philadelphia and the uh, Bridgeport area of uh, the United States. Anyways, for the last 75 years, AHS has uh, been a professional society holding a number of workshops and forums throughout the years, uh, throughout the year publishing both a magazine and a journal uh, having a strong and growing website presence, etc. We have over 11,000 technical papers available to members. We have over 800 issues of our magazine going back to 1955. Uh, it's a huge depository of knowledge regarding everything to do with vertical flight. Plus there's chapters around the world that involve both academic, industry, military, and R&D organizations. So if you're at all looking at vertical flight, uh, we want to be, have you as a member, and I think you would benefit also from being a member. This was the first uh, uh, dinner, actually, in 1944. That room is the pioneers of the vertical flight industry in the United States. Uh, the other area where uh, Vertical Flight Society has been active uh, has been in the area of electric uh, vertical takeoff and landing. We held our first workshop as part of transformative vertical flight in 2014 but have been publishing for a number of years prior to that. We just had our fifth event in San Francisco in January. Some of you were in attendance. We had 250 people there from all over the world. Uh, they went with the traditional hotel they've always had down on the waterfront in San Francisco. Uh, but if we'd had a larger room, we probably could have filled it with 500 people on the, uh, on the uh, program. Uh, our recent uh, forum in Phoenix uh, had attendance of over 1,100 people. We offered our first short course on electric uh, uh, vertical flight technology for engineers, intro for engineers, both on uh, uh, the performance aspects, the battery aspects, um, and that short course is now being offered. Uh, the room was full, again, sold out scenario, but that course is available online as a, a, a subscription basis. Um, if we talk about uh, the helicopter industry or vertical flight today, this is the latest and greatest on the commercial side. This is the Bell 505 made in Mirabel, entry into service in 2017, and 100 aircraft uh, 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 delivered so far. And this is a strategy where Bell dropped the price on an aircraft, 
put the Jet Ranger out of production in 2010, put this aircraft back into production two years ago, dropped the price from about 1.5 million down to about a million, and like Robinson, stimulated the market demand for vertical flight at, in the turbine uh, five seat basis. So this is sort of, you know, that's part of our worldview. The other part of our worldview is V-22s, tilt rotors, and uh, F-35s. Uh, if we look at traditional technology development uh, in vertical flight, a lot of it has come from military research and development programs. Generally, the US military will fund an engine program before they fund an airframe program. Uh, let's say in the case of the Black Hawk, which is celebrating 40 years of entry into service, the T-700 engine was developed prior to the competition, the UTAS competition, and out of that competition, there was a winning airframe, but the engine was already selected. Similarly, with the Rolls-Royce 250 engine and some of these other engines that are powering rotorcraft today, there was an R&D and a large military component. We've also had the role of uh, research organizations like NASA and others looking at both the aerodynamics, the structures, uh, the propulsion systems, etc., and feeding into this technology uh, uh, bucket, if you will, that the helicopter industry is drawn from. And then we've had the actual company-funded um, programs as well, both on fixed wing and rotor wing. And some companies uh, who maybe don't have as large a share of the mar military marketplace have spent maybe a higher percentage on uh, funding of uh, new aircraft, benefiting from other non-military sources. Perhaps we could talk about, say, Leonardo. Um, uh, and if we look at the other spectrum in terms of uh, OEMs, we have uh, you know, the development of airliners, helicopters, tilt rows, compound helicopters that have been funded by company dollars. Uh, if we look at innovation on the light end of the spectrum, we have people like Bert Rutan, Cirrus, Diamond, companies that have introduced uh, either new configurations of aircraft or uh, composite technology to create, in a sense, new market, or in case of Diamond, with putting the diesel engine into the market. And then we've also seen new classes of aircraft. We've had regional jets as one class that didn't really exist before. You could count the Yak-40, but this is a relatively recent occurrence of a 50-seat jet. We have the single-engine turboprop, IFR certified with Cessna Caravan, uh, par partnered with the PT-6, and now we have with the Cirrus, we have the, the, the single-engine jet category. So there's a couple of examples historically where we get new categories or configurations of aircraft that didn't exist before, or at least in great numbers. Oh, hang on. Okay, uh, let me just make sure I didn't go, right, there you go. Uh, so this is VertiFlight magazine, this is a flagship magazine of the uh, uh, Vertical Flight Society. And what we've seen in terms of just, you know, the cover pictures, we started to see from conventional tilt wings and helicopters into a whole bunch of new stuff uh, that's coming through the industry, both from traditional OEMs and from uh, uh, new, in a sense, startups or people who have not traditionally been playing in the aviation space. Yeah. And this is just, these are covers just in the last year and a half, right? So you can see the new configurations coming out from the military, uh, the Valor on the Bell side, uh, to uh, what Airbus is doing in the European side. But there's a very exciting time in the vertical flight industry, in some ways reminiscent of what occurred 75 years ago when the industry started and that kind of excitement and sort of blue sky, what, what can we do, what, what's possible? Um, so eVTOL, why now? We have a number of things taking place in the sense of convergence right now. Some of the technology is coming in from other industries, not necessarily being developed by the aerospace industry, and so that's how we've got around the technology development. Advances in batteries, computers, uh, modeling, simulation, AI, advances in composites, low-cost manufacturing, regulatory change in terms of can FAR Part 23 accommodate a aircraft that has both <coughs> vertical flight capability and traditional uh, winged flight. That's one possibility. Um, but the other thing, of course, is that the investment environment is such that money is flowing into the companies and companies that would maybe traditionally have been sort of back garage kind of projects have got the funding required to push and uh, attract the talent necessary to move things forward. Um, I think it was at Oshkosh 2010 when I was here, Sikorsky on their booth had a Schweitzer uh, 269 or a 300 CBI where they had taken out all the uh, engine and transmission 
and all the mechanical related stuff and they put two batteries on the sides of the aircraft and they had an electric motor there and they, and they were talking you know great guns about you know, electric flight and then it never flew and what happened well there was a realization within the helicopter industry that taking an existing aircraft configuration and swapping out the power plant was not the way to go that when you start to look at electric you are not duplicating the engines that are there and in a sense creating a horse drawn or a mechanical horse to replace a real horse but you're opening up the area to new configurations optimized to the power plant that you selected so the key thing here and we all know about this is distributed electric propulsion as the as the in a sense facilitator and then the benefits in terms of uh, reductions in cost to noise as some of the key drivers plus the ability for uh, with limited power available to go on a wing and therefore go further than you would if you were strictly a rotor rotorcraft. Okay so the prehistory uh, the known prehistory I guess is the key thing because it, what happens is that occasionally things come out of the blue that someone's been working quietly on an electric VTOL aircraft that you know nothing about until seven days ago. Uh, but of the known programs, we had the, uh, the uh, Project Zero at, at uh, Leonardo, we had the early E-Volo, we had Solution F in France, we had the NASA Puffin. These are sort of, in a sense, precursors to where we are now. Uh, but this is really going only back about eight years. Uh, recently, as of last week, we found out that uh, Marcus Lang uh, in Canada had flown an aircraft on October 5th, 2011, some, uh, just about 60 miles outside of Toronto, which at that time was called the Skycar Rebel, and now has been rebranded. Uh, he's just working on his third and fourth generation aircraft uh, as the opener Blackfly V2. So this is the V2 that flew in March. The V3 has not flown manned yet. But this is a kind of a scenario where there's stuff going on that we don't know. So there's a bigger picture than what we're aware of. Um, so disruptive, dis disruptive technology, um, it's an evolution in the uh, revolution sorry, in aerospace industry, electrification uh, is, is, the, is the path, cost reduction and green technology is one of the attractions. And in order to make it work well, you need to look at a highly integrated design. Um, we know what the key drivers are, it's all these different technology uh, pieces and building blocks that are coming together. Um, and the motivations, of course, there's a strong financial motivation uh, uh, amongst a lot of these projects to, you know, in a sense, tap into the next big market. Uh, but short term, there's a willingness to trade performance for uh, being first to market in a new mission or a new market uh, with the expectation that both the technology and the market will mature as the technology comes along. And then long term, uh, additional performance gains. So that, you know, we've heard here that the battery technology may not be there yet, but it's not, people aren't waiting. They're trying to move things forward. Uh, the, uh, on the NASA side, we have the Grease Lightning as an example of distributed electric propulsion, um, uh, where, in a sense, it was embraced by a government agency. And then on the entrepreneurial side, we have the Evolo. Uh, so, we this was just about a year and a half ago uh, when the the Evolo appeared. And again, I think for some people that was a bit of the wake up call. I remember being at Heli Expo two 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 years ago, and seeing the cover of the magazine and thinking, what? You know, for those people who are in the traditional helicopter world or vertical flight world, this is completely out in peripheral vision. It's not something that traditional helicopter industry is looking at, at least the commercial industry is you know, just becoming aware of now. Lilium, uh, again, new configurations brought about by distributed electric propulsion. In this case, rather than rotors, we're talking about fans and uh, distributed on both the uh, the, uh, the, 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 the wings and the canards, right? And there's more of a design optimized for longer distances. Ehang, uh, Mike Kirschberg's recent conversations with them in, uh, in Germany a couple of weeks ago, they have apparently 30 to 40, they built 30 to 40 of these aircraft that they've tested in China and they have a couple different versions. Again, the regulatory framework, the opportunity, where it's gonna go, uh, too early to say, but they've actually been you know, producing series production, um, uh, but it's still early days for them. Joby, we know that Joby's been flying for over a year and a half. They, was, they did invite some uh, reporters to the test center somewhere on the California coast where they were able to see an aircraft fly uh, 
uh, manned uh, in the test center area, and it was uh, the term was a, uh, twice the speed of a helicopter, making as much noise as a swarm of super bees. Now, I'm not actually sure how loud a super bee is, but uh, you know, you know, there's there's these projects, and this is some early material that Joby had released at our earlier uh, Vertical Flight Society forums in terms of configurations and. Um, uh, Of course, the other thing that took place, uh, and AHS at the time was quite involved in uh, consulting or contributing to the white paper, was the Uber Elevate uh, white paper, first of all, first revealed at one of the AHS workshops, and then the white paper in October 2016, and then the summit in April 2017, which is in a sense a, uh, a company that's in the transportation business, and as someone who's been in the airline business for many years, what, you know, I immediately wake up to is the fact that Uber has all this urban O&D data. Traffic flows, time of day, day of week, time of year, weather conditions, you know, and presumably they can match it to the demographics and the income of people in particular neighborhoods, et cetera, to in a sense assess a potential demand for an air service. Now, if you're in the airline industry as I was for many years at Bombardier and we were well initially doing transborder route development between Canada and the US there was no good data between Canada and the US if you started to go to secondary cities in the US all you had was a 10% sample which was the zero ticket on the coupons for an airline coupon and so in a small market 10% sample you really don't know how many people are say going from Edmonton to Kalamazoo so we actually had to start the route and see if the demand was there. We knew we could pair up the demand in terms of the Fortune 500 company on the Canadian side of the border and their parent company on the US to try and predict what traffic flow at that time was going through a Detroit or a Chicago with an elapsed time of four hours. And if we could put an aircraft in at 1.5 hours or a jet stream at 1.15. The expectation is that if we could put that non-stop surface in, we could stimulate traffic, and that's in fact what happened. But it was you're almost going in a bit blind in that case. So with this urban, uh, uh, the Uber kind of thing, or using cell phone data, you have much more data today that you can work from in terms of trying to determine what the O and Ds are. Similarly, when we did the regional jet marketing, the thing that we ran into was that the the, the regional airlines. Um, how are we doing for time? Uh, the regional airlines at the time, uh, they were dominated by turboprops. And so their, their world view was 250, 300 miles out from a hub. They knew all the little towns within 250, 300 miles of the hub. They ran the turboprops there, whether it was a Brasilia, a Dash 8, Beach 1900, ATR, uh, you know, any of the regional aircraft, and they, they scaled up. But they didn't know what lay beyond. And the mainline airlines, in terms of understanding what the market opportunity, they were basically limited to uh, cities outside the hub that could accommodate a DC-9 or a 737 or larger. So there was this gap in terms of understanding demand where the regionals didn't know what was over the horizon and the mainline guys didn't know the smaller markets. And so when we sold the regional jet, we had to model, in a sense, potential new routes and what kind of traffic we would be able to flow in through the hub that, and divert from another carrier. And the benefit was essentially taking a three-leg journey and reducing it to a two-leg journey, and someone could travel in less time, they would favor the regional jet service, but it was ultimately elapsed time, part of that was the, the selling points. Anyway, so we have the urban, now we're looking at those networks, but we're shrinking them from 300 mile range circle or uh, uh, or the, the RJ range of a turboprop to, or an RJ range circle of say 300 miles to a, a thousand miles, we're looking within the city itself. So it's a very exciting sort of concept. You know, you have the data there, can you put the technology in place? Can you put the infrastructure in place? Can you put the fare structure in place such that you can, just, you can do this on a very large scale? Um, so in terms of urban air mobility, NASA defines urban air mobility as a safe and evident efficient system for vehicles, pilots, pilots or not, to move passengers and cargo within a city. So the market we see, or, or the industry sees, is, is the fact that you're diverting people from congested roads. It's their, the value of their time and it's elapsed travel um, 
elapsed travel time. Uh, okay, I've covered a lot of this here. The, so it's a new value proposition, short haul EV tel flights to avoid congestion and save time. Creating an ecosystem, as m many of the people have alluded to, means that you can't just look at the vehicle, you can't just look at the, the, the vertiport, but you have to look at everything. Um, the market disruption that's taking place is not just in the fact that people are going to electric. The other thing that's going on here is that because you have Silicon Valley coming in with a different approach to airframe development to, say, the traditional OEMs, which is incremental and, and, and gradual, you have, in a sense, the OEMs fearing that they're going to be disrupted and therefore they have to internally create within their own organizations an engineering culture that can move at the same pace and with the same kind of dexterity as the Silicon Valley. So it's a very interesting environment now where within Bell, within, uh, within Airbus and others, they're trying to in change internally or in some case create an outpost like an A, an A3, A cubed. The, of course, the other traction is that if you can really scale this, uh, if you look at production rates right now, the most produced helicopter in the world is the Robinson R44. In the uh, period prior to the 2008 economic collapse, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the production rate, but Robinson maybe pushed 1,000 between the R, R44 and the R30, uh, R22. But you know, the kinds of numbers we're looking at in terms of potential here is exceeds what the helicopter industry has currently produced. Skorsky last year produced, I think, about 180 Blackhawks, or the, the last peak. But we're not looking at the helicopter industry as a high volume industry, but this is one of the attractions. But it also involves the technology in both the manufacturing and, you know, there's a number of other things, but you can, if you can get the economies to scale down, then there's an attractive in terms of the, op the, uh, the acquisition cost. Uh, Transformative vertical flight, we had the forum in, um, or we had the event in January. It was a watershed event in terms of technologists. We had traditional army. NASA, the OEMs, we had the EV tall manufacturers, we had the new tech companies, Toyota, Tyo, um, uh, Intel, Honda attended, uh, we had Amazon there, and then we had the big OEMs. It was in a very interesting environment to have all those people in the same room, some who've been looking at vertical flight for a long time, and a lot of people are fairly new or tapping into expertise in the round. Uh, we did a survey on the, um, Flight, Flight Global did a survey um, on February 19th, uh, their results were par par partially framed by the kind of question they asked, and it was generally a pretty negative one with 52 people, 52% believing that it was rank stupid in terms of air, tacti air taxis. Whereas the survey conducted after the fifth transformative vertical flight uh, uh, event workshop in San Francisco, you can see that um, uh, people did change their opinion based on the presentations that were given in terms of... Uh, so we have the Uber Elevate partners. I'm not going to duplicate uh, Adams here. Uh, we have uh, Aurora initially and now as a vehicle of Boeing. We have the uh, associated companies like ChargePoint looking at this. We have um, some people that we know at AHS quite well, the winners of the uh, Aero, uh, the AHS Sikorsky Prize in 2013 for the human-powered helicopter, the Aerovilo team, uh, Todd Riker and Cameron Robinson, uh, they built the human-powered helicopter, the human-powered ornithopter, and then Todd went on to set the world speed record for a bicycle on a, on a flat stretch of uh, 88 miles an hour, 144 kilometers an hour, unassisted, and they're now working for Kitty Hawk. So this was Todd last year at Oshkosh flying the prototype of the flyer uh, at the lake at the seaplane base. And of course, very interesting environment because there's other aircraft being developed in parallel under the same roof, uh, you know, with different technologies, different weights, different configurations, which makes for a very creative space place to work for, I'm sure. Uh, we have A3 by Airbus, currently flight testing the aircraft in Pendleton, Oregon at uh, the airport there, and that's on the cover. Um, currently being test flown unmanned, but by A3's uh, outpost out in the Silicon Valley. Uh, we have XTI in development in the Denver area. Some of the people who have spoken today are in that picture there. Um, uh, I believe are, are affiliated with both Trek and, and by Aerospace 
uh, and this is a aircraft with two ducted fans and then an internal fan, uh, but for a different kind of mission requirement, a little bit longer range using hybrid electric. Um, the other thing that happened this last year was at the CES, or the Consumer Electronics Show, which is one of the largest trade shows in the world, there were four, sorry, there was three different uh, eVTOL aircraft there. We had the Bell Concept, we had uh, Surefly, and in fact, on the stage of the Intel presentation, they flew the Volocopter. So you're sort of seeing this coming from the industry insiders coming out into the consumer market in terms of awareness. Uh, we don't use the word flying car at uh, Vertical Flight Society, but that seems to be the popular term. Um, our recent survey, so this is uh, as of the 15th of July, I'm sure it's out of date, but we identified 45 vectored flushed aircraft, 12 lift cruise configuration aircraft, 12, 24 wingless multi-copter aircraft, and 23 hover bikes, including some of the aircraft that were selected on the short list for the uh, GoFly prize, the 10 that were announced recently. If we go down into greater depth, uh, this is what we have. All of this is on the eVTOL news, uh, e e news website. We have profiles and technical profiles on all these aircraft there. And we also have a regular e-newsletter that we produce, uh, try to produce it twice a month, which has updates on all the programs. Uh, we're also producing uh, video uh, uh, profiles of a number of these different operators. And we hope to shoot a number of videos here at the show. Um, now, coming at this from someone who's been in both the helicopter industry and the fixed wing industry for a while and also living up in Canada, I thought I'd throw in a couple little insights I have. Um, uh, based on what I've been hearing about um, the potential for eVTOL and urban air mobility, and I have to say I haven't fully digested this, but there's a couple things that strike me. Uh, Post-war, there was tremendous optimism in terms of aircraft production. So Bell was part of those light aircraft manufacturers who saw great, saw, foresaw great demand for helicopters. They bought 500 engines from Franklin and it took until the Korean War to clear the engines. Production rates were low initially. In their case, they needed that military production order to get the cash flow necessary to make additional R&D investments. Um, American Helicopter Society in the 1953 issue of the, um, the, well, the first issue of the Journal of the American Helicopter Society, they had a number of panels sort of like this with the pioneers of the helicopter industry there, both the OEMs and the operators. And it's very interesting that there was a disconnect between what the operators put in their initial ads in 1947, 1948, in terms of how they thought the helicopter would be used and actually what people were doing to profit, profitably operate the aircraft. Uh, Bell had pictures of people landing in, you know, in executive suits and uh, spraying crops. And most of the people, and, and doing aerial news gathering for newspapers, most of those companies were unsustainable. If you talk to the pioneers, and I had a chance to talk to some of the pioneers of that first generation when I was doing oral history about 20 years ago. Um, if they were competing with another mode, and the other mode was cheaper, it was a real challenge to make money. The helicopter industry gravitated to those missions that no other vehicle could do, right? Working in the mountains, working offshore, overcoming geographic barriers where the, the, it wasn't as, the, 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 you couldn't make a simple apples to apples comparison. And oftentimes the success of the aircraft was not measured in terms of the, 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 the aircraft cost, but it was the reduction in time of the project how long it took to build a power line, how long it took to build a dam site, how long it took to fly out to an oil rig and not have uh, oil workers that were seasick from going out by boat. So the, so, you know, and in the, in the first journal, which is available to members online, you can read the, you know, Carl Agor, uh, Bob Suggs from PHI, uh, Carl Brady from Era Helicopters, you can see what the pioneers were, and they talk about how they had to shift their business model to become economical. All five helicopters that came into Canada in 1947 for, for agricultural use, four of them crashed the first year, and none of them made money flying uh, spraying crops. There were too many surplus aircraft around. Carl Ager in Vancouver uh, in 1948 uh, was asked to do a topo survey on the Canada-US border in the Skagit area near Mount Baker. Landed on a cirque at 4,000 feet in the, you know, below a glacier 
and that was the beginning of mountain flying anywhere in the world. This was the Kamano project that Bell and Sikorsky raved about in the early 1950s. Entirely supported by helicopter, thousands of men working there, over a million landings on you know, platforms. It was a monumental thing and it could not have been done without a helicopter. Helicopter airline boom. Uh, there was mass transit with helicopters in the 50s and 60s. Chicago Airways, LA Airways, San Francisco Airways. Um, and uh, what the helicopter industry was trying to do was re replicate what the airline industry did. In the 1920s, there was airmail contracts that were let by the US government to various airlines. The airmail subsidy helped cover the cost of the aircraft such that if you put a passenger on board, that was extra money. So the airmail contracts kick-started the airline industry in the US. The early helicopter airlines had either postal subsidies or direct subsidies. And the expectation is if you could get through a certain maturity cycle with the postal contract, you would have the same industry created. However, when the subsidies were pulled in 1964 by the US government, a number of the airlines uh, failed immediately, like Chicago Airways, and the others that continued um, with the exception of SFO, which was actually profitable, so it's those in the Bay Area, um, they had the subsidy from the airline. So the connecting uh, ticket out of uh, Wall Street heliport to uh, LaGuardia or uh, uh, well actually JFK or what was, I guess, Etowah at the time or Newark, that paid for the service. Um, in San Francisco case, the airline was profitable, but the Asset value of an S61 increased because of the North Sea oil drilling, and they sold their aircraft as a profit to the North Sea. So that closed the SFO. Now, subsequently, there were some small operators there. Um, New York Airways, of course, also had two crashes. They had the one on top of the Pan Am building, but there was more significantly, there was a crash in Newark later on. They were just about to buy Super Pumas and to change the fleet type, and at that point, it basically sank the company. Uh, New York helicopters sub did fly for a number of other years using uh, Dauphins and S55s, 58s, okay. Um, and then you had people like uh, Trump, uh, I don't know who this guy is, um, he had the shuttle service to the casinos, but it was subsidized by the casino service. Those aircraft ended up in British Columbia logging. We saw them come into Vancouver with uh, New York Airways and Trump colors, and they all went, stripped out the interiors, and they all went logging. Same with the New York Airways Virtual 107s, they went to Columbia helicopters. Uh, one other lesson from, Aviation history, uh, stall. I worked in Downsview at De Havilland, so really the, the center for stall research and development. And De Havilland had the idea also, you know, if you could land a beaver or an otter, a twin otter on a road or a dock in New York City or something like that, you could bypass the airports and create a completely new air service bypassing the infrastructure. There was a test service uh, called Air Transit between the docklands in Montreal and Ottawa that ran. And then De Havilland invested in the Dash 7. The success of the Dash 7 really was London City Airport. That was created to use only Dash 7s. However, the industry changed, and this was the important thing. Deregulation came and suddenly the airlines were no, no longer interested in niche markets. They were interested in something that was scalable. Uh, four engine aircraft that were quiet, they could do stall. They wanted two engine aircraft that had low direct operating costs. So this is a case where the market changed. Uh, urban markets, I'll make this last thing. Uh, if you're looking at a good example of a very efficient uh, urban air mobility market, uh, my hometown of Vancouver I put as one of the places in the world. Uh, this is the Vancouver Harbor Heliport when it first was floated into place in 1986. On the top of the office building there, um, almost 10 years earlier, Transport Canada put an ATC tower to oversee all the float plane and helicopter con traffic in the harbor. So it had ATC service. The building behind is the cruise ship terminal. At the base of the large building there today is both a subway station and a commuter rail station. Uh, the building that's between the heliport and the high rise is a commuter ferry service. There's the cruise ship terminal. And on the other side of the cruise ship terminal is the harbor air seaplane base. There are about 600,000 to 700,000 people flying every year on British Columbia South Coast that are not flying from an airport. They're either taking a seaplane or a helicopter. Uh, HeliJet has been flying 
so this is the original services that you would have, an otter, a single otter. Helijet has been flying for, um, I've got the number wrong there, 32 years they've been flying. Uh, scheduled service to Victoria. They fly to Nanaimo as well. They compete head-to-head -head with seaplane service and uh, it's, in a sense it's been unsubsidized. They've since diversified but they're, you land at the heliport and you can hop on a subway, you can hop on a ferry, you can hop on a commuter rail train, you can go to the downtown office buildings or you could take a seaplane flight up to Whistler and at Whistler catch a helicopter and change modes and at the top of the mountain get on a mountain bike and bicycle down. So there's an example of intermodal. Okay, so in summary, tremendous amount of funds invested in uh, eVTOLs, 100 companies right now, Vertical Flight Society. We have our 75th anniversary forum in Philadelphia coming up next year. In terms of resources, we have a lot of resources available, uh, including eVTOL news, uh, videos, transformative vertical flight events, um, and thank you very much.